welcome to the 11th webinar of the series Biodiversity Conversations, India's Opportunities and Challenges. All of these different webinars actually focus on various aspects of the national mission on biodiversity and human well-being. And this webinar series is jointly organized by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, the National Biodiversity Authority, and the Biodiversity Collaborative. I'm Shannon Wilson. I'm an associate professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore. I am also a, uh, a director of the ECHO Network, which is a social innovation partnership steered by the principal scientific advisor, and I'm a member of the Biodiversity Collaborative as well. So the topic for today's discussion is informing and engaging the public on biodiversity. So I'm super excited that we have such a diverse group and wonderful group of people, really warm-hearted people who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences with us today. But I do want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the purpose of today's session. So myself and Sahil Kedar of the Nature Conservation Foundation are co-PIs for program seven of the mission. And this program is geared towards effectively engaging India's citizenry in various roles as part of the larger mission. So one of our outcomes is to work towards building more capacities in biodiversity science through training programs targeting undergraduates, postgraduates, and biodiversity professionals. We also are seeking to support existing efforts and provide training and resources for citizens engagement projects like citizen science, which you've just had a conference on. And finally, we are seeking to mainstream biodiversity into India's public consciousness and discourse by strengthening biodiversity communication in all sorts of media and providing policy guiding outreach to specifically targeted groups of professionals and government officials. So it's this third objective that we're really focusing on with today's webinar. So today we're going to discuss ways to increase the awareness of biodiversity across India's many cultures and languages, how we can we streamline communication to large audiences, and what tools and infrastructure we can offer communicators for effective dissemination and engagement. Today's session is all about communication and generating knowledge and passion and inclusion for the peoples of India and the remarkable biodiversity that we have right out, out our back doors. So before I start introducing our speakers, I just have a couple of announcements to make. So please open your chat box that you'll see on the bottom of Zoom if you're following with us on Zoom and details will be sent there. We have already received some questions by email and we do welcome additional questions that you may have. So please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask these questions. If we can't get to them during the webinar because we run out of time, we'll try to answer them by, e by email. And you can also get in touch with us at contact at the rate of biodiversitycollaborative.org. So you can ask your questions anonymously if you want, but if you do and we don't get time to answer them, then obviously we can't reach out to you. So if you want your question answered, please make sure you leave your name and email address so that we can do so. The webinar is also being streamlined live on our Facebook page, which is called Biodiversity Collaborative. And we are also going to upload it to our YouTube channel, Biodiversity Collaborative, and you can see all of our other webinars there as well. Finally, we want to acknowledge the support we've received from the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India for conducting these webinars. So make sure you ask your questions in the Q&A uh, because that's the only way that we'll see them. So don't chat to us or raise your hand or, or yell at me or something like that, okay? So, so now I will start by introducing the fantastic people that we have with us today. The first is Nea Dara. Uh, she is the business head of Round Glass Sustain, and Round Glass Sustain is a really awesome, awesome adventure. It's actually a treasure trove of stories on India's wildlife, habitats, and their conservation. And they seek to encourage interest, respect, and love for our country's biodiversity and build communities who will value and protect it. Neha has been a travel writer and an editor for most of her career, and she's taken a keen interest in sustainability and responsible tourism. And she's happiest trekking in the Himalayas, scuba diving in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, exploring local markets in small town, and I think staying in the foothills as well, I would say. Yeah, so thank you, Neha, for joining us. Thank you, Shannon, for having me. Yes, foothills of the mouth right now, getting a break to sleep. Okay, now you're breaking up a little bit right now. So if, if, it, if this continues, I'll, I'll just tell you to turn off your video, but hopefully we won't have to do that, so, okay. 
Our next speaker is Subhaganam Kanan. He is an environmental journalist at Ananda Vikampan, a leading weekly magazine and digital media published in Tamil, from obviously Tamil Nadu. His in uh, it's Ananda Vigran. What? Ananda Vigran. Ananda Vigran. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry. That's very hard for my American mouth to speak. So I apologize to all of you out there. That my, so I won't say that word again. I will just point to you and you can say it. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, his interests lie in environmental and data journalism, video scripts, and wildlife photography. And he loves to explore forests and its wildlife and document the state of environmental degradation in cities. He has translated the report of the Western Ghats Ecological Expert Panel into Tamil. And currently he's working on a book named Water Mafia, which analyzes the paradox of water becoming commercialized while also being fundamental right of every citizen. So Bhaganam, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sorry that I butchered the name of the organization you for. Hi all, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Arti Kumar Rao. She is a National Geographic explorer, she's an independent photographer, a writer, and she's an artist. And she documents the slow violence of ecological degradation. She crisscrosses South Asia, following stories across seasons and sometimes over multiple years. And she chronicles South Asia's changing landscapes and climate, the effect on the livelihoods and their biodiversity. She communicates through photos, long form narratives and art and is working on her first book. Her work has appeared in National Geographic, The Hindu, Disturbed, The Guardian, BBC Outside Source, Hindustan Times Mint and many, many, many other places. And I am just enthralled by her talent actually. And I'm so happy to finally get to work with her. And when she's not in the field, she calls Bangalore home and she's a happy slave to three rescued cats and I'm a happy slave to one. Oh, nice. Bangalore. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everybody, for having yeah, me. Yeah, thanks very much. Last but very, very much not least, we have Rohan Chakravarti. He is a cartoonist for Green Humor, and he says he's notorious for rolling up into a ball like a pangolin to avoid meeting people. But I want to tell you, you have to deal with that today. So he is a cartoonist, illustrator, and creator of Green Humor, which I'm sure you've seen. It's a fantastic series of cartoons and comics and illustrations and all sorts of commentary on wildlife and nature conservation. The cartoons from Green Humor have actually appeared in newspapers, magazines, and journals, and their illustrations have been used in several projects and campaigns on wildlife awareness and conservation. Rowan has offered, authored two books, The Great Indian Nature Trail by WWF India, Bird Business, and has also won awards by UNDP, Sanctuary Asia, WWF International, and the Royal Bank of Scotland for his work. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Shannon, and hi, everybody. In case you see me rolling into a ball, just, just know that the questions are too difficult. Thank you. I'll try to virtually poke you and get you to unroll again, all right? <laughs> okay, Thanks, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and start actually with our questions. And, and this will be for those of you in the audience, we're gonna try to make this a little bit more like a conversation rather than a series of presentations. So I will try to be going back and forth between our different speakers. So Nea, I want to start with you. Um, so the first aspect of communication is actually understanding the audience that you're dealing with. And, and I'd like to hear from your perspective and then also from our other panelists, how you feel is the current level of understanding and awareness of biodiversity among the different stakeholders that you work with with Ranga Sustain and also in the private and public sectors that you also interact with. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me this time, Shannon. If you lose yes. me at any point, let me know. Uh, I'll be honest, I, it's not good. It, knowledge about biodiversity is extremely limited. I think that there is a small group of people who are very aware, who have already discovered how awesome India's wildlife and biodiversity are. And I tend to call them the initiated because they're so full of excitement and joy for it. Um, but when it comes to the larger number of people out there, knowledge is extremely limited. We tend to think of wildlife as something that is not related to us. You know, it's something that's in the forest or it's in the ocean. It's not near me. And that's really not true. So one of the major things that we do with Rangla Sustain is try to show people the kind of wildlife that exists around them. And, you know, thankfully, one of the good side effects of this pandemic, which has been awful otherwise, has been that people have slowed down and taken the opportunity to see the diversity in, you know, 
the vacant house lot next to them or the neighborhood park or their own balconies and sat up and said, oh my God, wildlife is right next to me. So I think it's really important to show people how it affects them, you know, and, uh, but, um, you know, that whole sense of it's something other and not me exists. The second problem that exists is that uh, when people are aware of wildlife they're aware of it in this very uh you know grandiose sort of way you know there have been a lot of big documentaries which have been fabulous and they've been a, doing a wonderful job of making people aware of the big issues out there um but what happens with them is that the focus is often western it's not uh centered on india or even the subcontinent or when they have been media they have been focused on a few star species so you know you'll see the rhino the elephant the tiger but not much beyond that and a lot of getting people excited about wildlife and how diverse it is, is showing them the little creatures which people really don't know about because most of the reactions we get on the content we put out there is Oh my God, I didn't know we had this or Oh my God, this is amazing. Thank you for showing me something new. But the good part in all of this is that I do think there is an appetite for it. So, you know, but yeah, to sum up, I don't think awareness really is very good right now. Yeah, so but basically you're optimistic as is in the in in the end that you think it's you yes. know there's at least an interest for it, but maybe the awareness is not there. So so yes. that's why want to go to you because you're you're a journalist and actually we got it we got a question from Swagata Chakraborty and she also asked is it even possible to create true awareness among the public so I'd, I'd really like your perspective on this issue as well um, yeah sure but uh, to be honest same like Neha uh, when we come to the government Indian government's current level of understanding and awareness uh, is very much lacking to the required level we all know that there is an urgent need for a greater communication and of course investment on the part of the government in sustainability issues um, but the policies and decisions made by the government show that they are still uh, a bit of hesitate hesitation they have a bit of hesitation in taking steps regarding any environmental issue later on biodiversity conservation i hope all are aware about uh, the recent uh, finance ministry's recommendation to the environment ministry uh, on disengaging the autonomous bodies often when there is an economical crisis Cutting the fund for conservation like this is being the first step taken by the governments, not only in India, but all over the world. This shows that the government bodies doesn't have enough understanding when it comes to conservation. Um, uh, this is the current level of uh, understanding in the government. India is always playing a choosing game between environment and economy, but there is an urgent need for them to embrace both and should understand the importance of green economy where we could plan sustainably for both economic development and environmental protection, of course, in harmony with nature's balance. Um, you asked about the public, isn't it? When it comes to the public, awareness and understanding is not far better than the past. But a deficit in knowledge leads to led by conclusions. Um, they have a, there is a deficit of knowledge in between the public. To be frank, uh, the word biodiversity itself is a hardly a word of common news in public. From my experience with the common uh, or, or in all the languages, right? All, all Indian languages don't necessarily have a very good direct translation. Yeah, yeah, for it. of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from my experience with the general public, uh, they are think they, uh, they think that uh, what biodiversity means is the great variety of life forms in uh, ecosystems. The, the does not lead them to uh, recognize the interconnectedness of these forms in the ecosystem. So uh, this term needs a uh, repeated uh, explanation and connection when we are communicating with the public. Uh, believe me, even with the global concern of climate change and natural destruction, biodiversity protection or conservation is not in the top rank when it comes to the public priority. This is the situation now. So the public is not aware of the central connection there. The degradation of habitat leads to the human health, economies and political instability. These implications, uh, we are not aware of this uh, central uh, connection. That we should communicate better and engage the people, not just making them understand and aware. We should engage the people uh, in the biodiversity conservation. We should make them a part of the biodiversity conservation. So, RT, I, I just wondered if you wanted to weigh in here because, I mean, I. I... So I know he mentioned both awareness of government and awareness of the people and how actually that lack of awareness can lead to bad outcomes for both, essentially. I, I, I don't know if you want to comment on this because I know it's something you're very passionate about. Yeah. Um, 
So yes, the awareness of the government or even their actions, which are in direct opposition to their words, if you were to go by, say, the MOEFCC's tweets, in fact, for example, uh, it, it kind of throws a curve ball at all of us. And we're wondering, you know, so is one hand talking to the other? Do they even realize what they're saying or is that deliberate? So that, that apart. Um, when it comes to the public, yes, indeed. Um, I, it's, it's strange. I move between three different worlds. Um, you know, I, I talk to the scientists and I hear a particular language. And then I live among these people who are high net worth individuals and entrepreneurs and, you know, the CEOs of startups, which are like unicorns and decacons or whatever they call and so on. And I find a stunning lack of curiosity. There isn't that, oh my, see, they don't even see it. So it's hard for them to be concerned about something that they don't even notice. So, you know, that I feel is like a, a, a problem. And I think that also comes down to urbanization, cocooning yourself, wherever you go, you're in an air conditioned car with the windows rolled up and your ears plugged in, you know, it's, it's you're in your world, you're not really looking outside. Um, I've always been stunned by people who, who grab a window seat in a plane and fall asleep. And you know, I'm like, how can you do that, you know? So um, that kind of stuff. And I see that around me a lot. And, um, and I feel therefore that, um, it, yeah, that that law, that lack of curiosity. I think if we can regain that, the paying attention, the wonder at the world, you know, some of those things, um, that that is uh, is currently not there. And when it comes to actual understanding of nature, or naming things, or even just um, knowing what you're looking at, um, it's it's absolutely not there. But there is a fear. So, for example. Well, I live in a community where they do not, they do not, they cannot tell the difference between earthworms. They call them leeches. They want everything eradicated, like take it out from here. Can we do something to just get rid of all of this? Snakes. Uh, somebody even complained about a coal singing too loudly. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's a very different world. And so when I move between these worlds, I find, um, I find them as silos or cocoons. And I think we start, need to also start talking to each other. Yeah, uh, that's really great comment about interacting among these different groups. So, Rona, I want to I want to turn to you now um, because we've heard all of these different aspects from you know government and the public and 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 industries and all sorts of aspects. And I'd like to know, you know, who who do you feel then we need to reach out to most? I mean, it, obviously everyone needs to get this information, but where do we where do we even start with this? Um, and I'm not sure if you also might be interested to show some of your cartoons to, to illustrate this, because I really do think your artistry actually does reach a, a broad swath of people. It really speaks to so many, which is really remarkable. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on this. Thanks, Varshan. So uh, would you suggest that we uh, play the slideshow first and then- Absolutely. Start? Let's All right, sure, sure. Okay, let's go. Wait till they come up here. Put together a short slideshow of just the preview of my work so that the audience is uh, familiar with what I'm talking about. I just want to assure Aarti that what she spoke about is not happening here. I have a Potter wasp uh, building a nest right above my head. So uh, you were not who I was talking about, <laughs> Rohan. Far from it. I know, I know. Okay, you can just uh, scroll through. There's, there's just a few uh, previews and yeah. All right, next, next please. Just, just a short preview of the kind of stuff I do. Uh, my mainstay is cartoons and comics. Other than that, I also do do all sorts of illustration work, which. Uh, depicts, you know, uh, flora and fauna and, and all its its glory. Uh, next, this is one of my uh, pet projects which I've taken, been taken to, uh, taken to various places, uh, not just countries but also national parks, even urban spaces like cities, and drawing wildlife maps of of these regions. This is one sample which shows all the wildlife in India. And finally, uh, I think I have a preview of my uh, my book, Bird Business, which is a, a collection of hundred illustrations of of bird behavior uh, from from uh, from the Indian uh, context. So, Ron, 
mean, this is fantastic. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a huge fan of yours. And I, but I'd like to know, you know, who, who, when you're creating all of these amazing illustrations and stories, you know, little uh, illustrative stories, who, who are you making them for? Like, who is in your mind when you make them? What, what is your thought process? So I just like to go back to what Neha said. Neha said there's an appetite for uh, biodiversity when uh, she spoke like a true business head. I think it's not just the appetite, it's also a dire need for, for you know, this kind of communication to happen and not just to happen, but also to be made mainstream. Now, I think in what India is going through is a huge conundrum because we have on one hand, some really good science happening, some really good science, both in theory and, and in practice, you know. I think, uh, I think more than a hundred new species have been added to the Indian index uh, this, this year itself. And that's a huge, huge number. And we have all this uh, fascinating science going on in one hand. On the other hand, we have you know, complete, uh, a complete lack of awareness about it. Uh, to give you an example, when four new damselflies were discovered uh, just last month in September, every media channel was going on about uh, what kind of drugs uh, Bollywood actors have been consuming. So, you know, this is not something that affects our lives directly. I mean, yes, maybe you know, drug addiction is a, is a problem, but, but you know, the, I, I personally feel that damsel flies affect our lives a lot more directly than Bollywood and who's consuming, consuming what drug. And that's because damsel flies eat mosquitoes and save us from malaria. They're, they're a public health service and people do not see them that way. People, people don't even know what damsel flies are. I mean, forget about, you know, their, their role in ecology. So I think that really needs to change, and uh, that that's about people. What uh, what I want to say about the government government is that you know there's a simple yardstick to measure how aware the government is about uh, about science and about biodiversity. If you just look out of uh, of your window onto the street, you you'll most likely see a patch of horticulture that's being undertaken by the government, and in all likelihood you will see exotic plants. And you know that itself speaks about how aware. Uh, your your local government or your uh, state or central government is about regional uh, and Indian biodiversity, and you know that uh, it doesn't give you a good picture. Uh, and and there's some fascinating work being done about these matters too. Uh, a, a wonderful book called Cities and Canopies was brought out about about uh, uh, exotic plants versus native plants and their benefits. So yeah, there's a huge huge uh, communication gap which needs to be addressed with various kinds of creative communication. So you, you brought up one really important thing that I've heard a couple of times already, and this is this idea of making a connection, right? I mean, the reason why the newspapers don't pr talk about damselflies is because everybody will be like, who, who cares? Like, what does that matter? It's just some bug, right? You know, I work on insects, so I take that personally. But I mean, you know, that connection is really important. And Arte, I want to go to you on this. So, so how, how do we go about making a connection, right? How do we connect people and biodiversity rather than just giving them information, right? Rather than to make them really feel like they're they're part of it. And this is actually a question that we got from Pavitra Asha Kumar, who asked, how can we make actionable items that people can take up for biodiversity related issues and conservation that make them feel part of it and not just these passive observers? Yeah, um, it, it, it comes down to a word that Shubhaganam used, uh, involve. And um, I, I, want, I want to go back to a Native American proverb, which says, uh, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I may not remember, involve me and I'll understand. And once you understand, you begin to love. When you love, you will protect, you know? So um, there is, it's, it's, an, it's a natural cycle. And I think they had it absolutely right. And um, there have been studies around the world, you know, when it comes to how do you, and every country seems to be grappling with how do you make nature, um, how do you connect the people back to nature, you know? And this is, it, it's in the West, every country. And I, I, I had to just do one search and I came up with so many studies on how to, how to do that. But uh, basically, they seem to be, uh, th there seems to be something that's quite, um, you know, it's, it's something that Neha mentioned right in the beginning. There is this othering going on where uh, a person looking at, um, you know, consuming content either on TV or whatever sees exotic stuff, you know, polar bears or tigers even. I mean, even in India, right? And everybody doesn't live around a tiger or whatever. So it's, it's always this exotic 
amazing, fabulous creature that's somewhere else that you go away to a vacation for, you know, it's not something that's in. And um, a lot of studies have shown that if you bring that back, if you are able to connect local geographies to people, you know, um, it makes, it starts making a lot more sense. And that's how then you can involve them in that situation. And um, it also comes down to, uh, there is no such thing as a general audience, right? It's not a monolith. So you need to understand there are, there are different segments, different people that need to be spoken to differently. Messaging has to be different and so on. So targeting, targeting the people, um, you know, after understanding who, what they know or whatever, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff, t targeting a segment. Um, and then um, doing something that's exploratory or experiential, you know? So it's something that they are doing, that they are involved in, um, something that's interactive. Uh, that, you know, the, it's not a one-way process. So you can ask questions, you can discuss, it's social, uh, it's, um, it's local, it's long-term, it's sustained. It's not a one-shot thing that you did it on one Sunday and then you've forgotten it forever. So it's something that's sustained and it's stable. Um, and um, and, and it's, um, it's engaged, so it engages the person. So it, it asks questions of the person, the person asks questions of you. And so it's a harder problem than one blitz you know, or many blitzes, it's a harder problem because it is local. And which means then that you have to work that much harder to be able to involve, you know, different kinds of communities in different kinds of situations and so on. So it's hard work, but I think we have come to a point where if we don't do it, we're going to be shooting ourselves big time in the foot. So we, I mean, it's now an imperative. You just have to do something like that, but it comes down to that huge amount of involvement and taking it very local. Raghunam, I'd really like your inputs on this, you know, about especially maybe commenting on Archie's uh, remark about localization of it, which is actually, when you think about the heterogeneity of India in all possible definitions of that term, I think it's, that's a really difficult task. And it's something that I know that we, as, as part of, you know, helping with this biodiversity mission have been really struggling with, you know, how do you, how do you reach people on a local level when it's such a diverse issue? Um, so, so I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, actually, uh, reaching the local people, we must reach them with a local language, regional language, communicating with them in the regional language is the foremost important thing when we communicate them about the biodiversity when we take the conservation to them personally it will connect them with the nature personally see uh, uh, every regional language has its uh, bunch of uh, vocabularies regarding nature every language has it uh, most importantly environment and language may be seen as a part of the same whole because over time, humans communicated closely with the environment, modifying it as they adapted it and acquired the knowledge it had offered, acquired the knowledge of the nature. Um, 2000 years before Tolkapiyam in Tamil told that Nilam Thi Neer Bali Visumbodu Aindum Kalamda Mayaka Mulagam. It says water, land, fire, everything is the, is it, every, every, all of it is the combination of a world. The, see the this the knowledge was encoded and transmitted to the uh, through the vocabularies of the local people's language local regional languages we should um, connect with them from their in their language we should uh, re uh, regenerate or re uh, we should bring bring back the those vocabularies and connect with them that i i think um, that will be the solution to connect with them personally yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to do it in the language that the, that the person's speaking. You heard how badly I butchered your, <laughs> your organization. So absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Neha, I want to I want to turn to you now because you know we've been also talking about making this connection, but there's a really big difference between communication and dissemination, right? They're actually completely opposite. Communication is bi-directional. Our team mentioned the the need to engage people, and that means that you have to be ready to get information back, like we're doing today. So I'd really like to hear you and, and also how Ranga Sustain is trying to do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like um, Aarti talked about all the many things that we've been trying to do at Sustain and we've experimented in the past. And, you know, it's been such a learning curve for us in the past year and a half. Uh, you know, dissemination and communication, in a way, it's really just a difference of whether you're talking at somebody or with them. You know, that's really the main thing. And, uh, you know, 
it's very important that we do make things interesting for people. Uh, you know, the whole idea with what we're doing at Sustain is to sort of make science accessible, remove the jargon, make it relate to your everyday. So one of the things that we do a lot of, which we talked about right now, was showing people what exists right around them. For the longest time, I lived in Bombay, and I just thought that Bombay's ocean was just like the murkiest, dirtiest thing, and nothing could survive there. In the past two, three years, I've learned of the amazing diversity that exists in the tidal pools just off the coast. And, you know, we want to encourage people to go out and have these experiences and see these things, because that's so important to realize that this will matter to me. This is right around me. It's not far away. Um, you know, we try to create content for different kinds of consumers. You know, they're the initiated that I talked about before. Um, there are those with whom humor works really well. So Rohan does a column for us and it's hugely popular. You know, it helps us bring in younger people. It helps us bring, uh, you know, new audiences. It helps us talk about policy and important things in accessible ways. And a very important job that some of the content that we do serves is to turn heroes out of small everyday wildlife creatures. So that, you know, we're not just talking about Bollywood heroes, but wildlife heroes who impact our everyday lives. So I think the kind of work Rohan does really helps with that. Um, you know, so that's the, the other thing is of course, you know, to make the communication two way. So we try and involve people in discussions on the social media, really helping us do that. Uh, you know, a lot of quizzes, puzzles, interactions, commentary, conversations. It's so important so that people start feeling that, okay, here's something that I can do to make a difference. And it can be as, you know, conservation is very inclusive, actually, if you think about it. If I'm sitting here and I take a picture of a cicada on a tree or a butterfly and I share it to, with people around me i've already contributed because i've highlighted something that exists right next to me so you know it, it's very democratic everybody can be a part of it and we just need to uh you know make that possible i actually wanted to do a bit of show and tell uh shannon so uh you know for example there is one issue that has been talked about ad nauseum we have talked about how building roads through forests is not a good idea it's fragmenting forests. It can result in roadkill. It causes noise pollution. But it's one thing to say these things. And it's quite another thing to make a connection with it and actually see the impact, to see the beauty of it that will be lost. So just to highlight that, a, may I request you to play the film that I've shared with you? Because I think that'll really help. Just like how birds sing, each species of frog or a toad has its own kind of call. Frog calls basically are a signal from a source to a receiver. Typically, the frog calls you hear are a signal to the female, telling something about the male. And uh, in ignorance, the female tends to choose males based on the quality of the call. And you like to remember that there is no one-to-one -one signaling that's going on. In a given area, there are multiple males trying to attract females. If there is a male that's calling at a higher pitch for the longest part of the night, then the female maybe uses it as a measure to say, despite all the risks, this male is still continuing. Maybe it's got good teeth. One of the interesting frogs that uh, you can hear when you go to places like Agumbe, the call is like a water droplet falling into a bucket. It kind of goes like tuck. And these frogs are half the size of my thumb. It starts with the trrr, tick, 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 tick. It goes on for like 40 or 45 such notes. We don't know what the, what the trrr and the tick mean for the individuals out there. 
the male frogs squeeze inside bamboo and they start calling from inside of bamboo. One thing that we measured was we looked at how many times they make this call per minute and they seem to produce I think uh, 11 calls per minute and they call from 6 p.m. to like 4 a.m. 5 a.m. They continuously call and it takes an incredible amount of energy for a frog that's half the size of my thumb to make such calls. With frogs, what happens is they have a closed system where they take in air, they close their nostrils and they pump the air from the abdomen into what is called a vocal sac, which is usually at the base of the throat. Essentially what the vocal sac does is it acts like a reverberation chamber. It's like the base of a, a vena, for example. It amplifies the sound and that's one way how frogs are able to be so loud. Habitat loss, such as say building a road in there, it would open up parts of the forest and there would be other noise that comes in. And this will have implications of how the communication works between frogs. Studies have shown that the male frogs alter their frequency or they start calling at different times of the night. Calling consumes energy and it's making the frog vulnerable. You know, this video, it got such great reactions because people were just amazed by the variety of sounds that frogs made. And these are not exotic frogs, they're everyday frogs. You see them, you know, outside your door, your window, in the garden, and you don't even pay them attention. And they're so beautiful. And, you know, we don't realize how something as simple as vehicle noise is impacting them so significantly. And it's something that we can easily do something about. You know, so uh, we feel like this is the kind of communication that can really make a difference and have an impact. Yeah, it's really, it's really beautiful. So Rona, I mean, you know, we just saw this fantastic video from Neha, right? So, which I think is a, is a really good illustration of, of a, a very effective technique for, for getting some engagement, you know, asking people to go out and listen to frogs. And it's something that you can hear almost anywhere in India, honestly, even in the middle of Bangalore, I can hear frogs. So Ron, I, I, you know, you, he, she also mentioned that you do a column for them. So I'd like to hear from you what are some new opportunities that exist in India to reach very large audiences and, and what makes them effective or exciting. And this is really similar to a question that was asked by two different uh, audience members, uh, Hanumantha and R Rajesh Joshi asked, what are the best practices or methods of reaching the public on biodiversity? So I'd, I'd like to hear what you, what you have to say. Well, uh, as far as reaching out, outreach is concerned, I've been a little old school throughout my career. Uh, you know, I've relied on newspapers and newspaper columns to form a sort of a base of audiences. And I think, you know, the time for being old school and time for uh, being orthodox is, is now gone. It's, it's, it's obsolete now. And as the web is expanding, as new opportunities pop up, uh, even we as communicators need to, you know, be on our toes and adapt. And I think uh, the sooner we... We, uh, people like me adapt to the web, the better it is. Uh, what I rely on is called anthropomorphism, which is uh, to attribute uh, human characteristics to, some, to something that is not human. I believe that that goes a long way in helping me to you know, put, put across my message and, and to build that connect between my subjects, which is wildlife, and, and my readers. So I use anthropomorphism as something that I believe is a friendly handshake between, between my, my subject and my readers. There can be various other creative methods of, of communication and engagement. Uh, something that's coming out tomorrow, I think, uh, uh, is uh, it's, it's releasing tomorrow, is a, uh, a virtual reality film uh, by a, a filmmaker called Ram Aluri, who's filmed in Eagle Nest. And uh, I think, you know, that, that's, that's a step beyond uh, what has already been happening, filmmaking, uh, photography, or even illustration. Virtual reality is, is a step beyond all of this. And that's, you know, uh, I think more and more such methods of engagement need to, uh, you know, need to be invented and, and engage with. 
Absolutely. And um, Neha, I just want to go back to you, I'll return to you for a second, because uh, this also kind of relates to what Subhaganam said a few minutes ago about local languages and regionalization. So I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that as we've been creating all this content with Sustain, we've obviously realized that this is a very important part, right? That's this video that we just showed you would have so much more impact if it was also reaching out to people in local languages. So that's a journey that we've actually now started embarking on. And this month, we released a whole series on the Sundarbans that we have released in Bengali as well, so that it can go out to local audiences. There are two interesting things here because you know, the internet, especially during this whole lockdown, has penetrated a lot further, right? And a lot more people are using it. So there is more local language penetration possible through the internet. But at the same time, we do realize that it's not enough to just translate into another language. We are going to have to find um, systems to, you know, get this in front of the audiences that matter, to get it to the fishermen, the boatmen, the people who live in the Sundarbans. And I think that this is one of those examples of, you know, what Arti mentioned earlier, where instead of being in our silos, we need to talk to each other and help each other because, you know, schools, colleges, industries in these places can help do this. This would be so much easier with them. The other thing that I think is very important when uh, talking about localization, and it's one of the things that we're now going to be engaging with in the coming year is that it's not simply enough to just translate, right? Uh, localization is not just about talking in a different language. It's also about talking to a different audience. So, you know, you need to look at the work world differently as well. Now, um, this is an example that uh, I was talking to Pooja Mitra of Terra Conscious, who's been doing fabulous work in Goa. And she said that, you know, uh, when the fishermen she works with see Goa in any imagery, whether it's in nature documentaries or in travel, it's always this kind of Goa that they say, hey, we only saw 20 years ago. This is not our Goa. So it's very important to show them not a sanitized version of what exists, but a real everyday version that they see around themselves. So I think these are very important issues that we need to engage with and we need to get the messaging right about from the start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Subhayanam, since this was kind of stimulated by something that you said, I just wondered if you wanted to follow up on what Naya has been saying. You're muted. <laughs> Yeah, my bad. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, it's not about just translating like Neha said. Uh, we should connect with them in the personal language. That is the most important thing. Um, so when we uh, translate uh, the knowledge from uh, English or some other language to the regional language, there are many words for, see, there are many words for biodiversity in Tamil. But we are directly translating it to uh, in direct translation is the most uh, thing we are doing now. So we should search for the words in the regional languages and that will connect with the people the more often. You're absolutely right. I'm, I'm not really supposed to be talking, but I have to share this anecdote with you. So I'm part of a global consortium for COVID response and we had this survey and I was trying to trans have it translated into local languages, as many as we could in India, okay? At least the major ones. And we ran into this problem, right? Because our translators were native speakers and they wanted to translate the survey in a way that was understood in like the local uh, way of speaking, right? And not in some really you know, Google Translate version, but the ethics committee was concerned that we were changing the words. And we said, well, we, if we use this word, it makes no sense in, you know, Gujarati or whatever language you're dealing with. So it's interesting, right? Because that creates this paradox with science, right? Because we are so precise in science and you can't worry about that precision because there is a lot of words. We mentioned biodiversity. There's tons of words for biodiversity, but they're not biodiversity. They have their own nuance, right, in different languages. And so you may have to use two words or you may have to use a different word. So I, I think this is such an important consideration that you bring up that it's not just the translation, but it's actually the whole cultural nuance of the language as well. I would well. like to add, uh, add on, uh, one more point. See, every culture has its own way of uh, seeing the science and approaching the science. So they had their own set of words in the science vocabulary. So we should search for it. That's the first thing we should do in connecting with the people. 
Yeah, RT, I was gonna, I was just about to come to you anyways. Um, I, I'd actually really like you to weigh in. And also, um, you know, this kind of leads into the next question I wanted to ask you about, you know, misconceptions and gaps in communication that we've overlooked. So maybe if you could kind of comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add, since you guys were talking about uh, uh, words in other languages, um, I'm a huge fan of resurrecting the vernacular lexicon, you know, because uh, in my travels through Rajasthan, and then I came up with this landscape glossary, which I then threw open to the public, and the responses I got were fantastic, because these are people who lived with the land, they saw the land a particular way, and therefore they described it in a particular way. And those descriptions have been lost to us now, you know, because we are now kind of uh, homogenizing in terms of how we speak, we use certain terms, so on and so forth. But like, for example, the first train that calls up a particular hill, the Indian Shad, the Hilsa uh, in the rivers of uh, the Sundarbans, it has a name in Bengali. You know, that particular rain has a name in Bengali. I know that rain in Tamil has so many different kinds of words, right? So I think resurrecting that language would again create an excitement around, around the world, around us, you know, the, the uh, environment around us. And coming to gaps um, and, 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 and misses, um, this might be just a, a, a tiny part of it, but I feel it's, uh, it's important in that, I think the question that I grapple with is how do I make it exciting again for people in their everyday life? It's not something that they have to go away for, right? So in, in, their, in their life. And I feel that there have been three large misses. One is the landscaping of cities. Uh, the, the urban planning and the landscaping of cities has somehow missed the boat. You know, they have tried to bring in exotic palms and, and lawns, in, inert, inert landscapes, which don't really foster the kind of biodiversity that is inherent to, uh, to a city. That was one, so landscaping. The second one is um, uh, the entertainment industry, right? In movies, we, we don't see, uh, we see lawyers, we see doctors, we see so many other people, but we don't see nature as part of something, you know, we don't see people either fighting for it or enjoying it or in a way that is meaningful. That's the and second part. And sci-fi never has nature in it. Sorry? You, movies about the future never are about nature. They're exactly. always about like sterility. Exactly. And All the trees are gone. Yeah. yeah and then, and, and this was driven home to me actually when uh, this and the landscape thing, when I was speaking to a superstar in Bollywood, you know, one of the biggest names, I'm not going to take his name, but the biggest name. And he said that he has never been in nature. He has never gone to a forest. This man is 50 plus. He's never stepped into a forest until many years ago on a holiday with his kids in the Masai Mara. So nothing in India at all. And that stunned me, you know, that kind of disconnect. And the third industry I feel is the tourism industry. You know, it has somehow lost. It takes us from one place and puts us in our own cocoon in another place. And, and you know, it's everything is manufactured around our, um, you know, uh, in our experience there. But it does not open us out to um, what the world around there is like, you know, even just like the place that Neha is sitting in, right? And she talked about the cicada on the tree. How many people, how many of us go to hotels and even notice the trees around, right? I mean, it's so these three industries, I feel, have kind of dropped the ball. And we need to somehow reclaim that because that is an everyday part of our life. All of our cities are landscaped. We're reading books, we're seeing movies, we're listening to songs. So that's part of our life. And um, tourism, we all take, you know, we all go somewhere, do something. So, you know, I think uh, those are three big, um, big misses. And then, of course, the jargon, you know, if we can do something to, to make it more accessible, the whole uh, biodiversity or nature, uh, those, those, I, those are what I see. And I'd love to hear from, from the others as well. I definitely have to go to Neha because she actually has a direct connection with the tourism. So, you know, and actually it's something I don't know about. How, how is the sustain actually thinking about those aspects and how are you thinking about those aspects? Because you have such a background in this. Yeah, um, you know, I, I was just, that's why I was nodding along when Arti was talking about it. So I've been a travel writer, right? And over time as someone who was just, you know, I've loved the outdoors. I love being out there. So you have to be blind to see that the way we've been traveling is so, so harmful. And you obviously want to keep changing that. Uh, 
And this is why this whole idea of responsible, sustainable travel came about. But, you know, I think there's a very important lesson to be learned there as well, because, you know, what happened when responsible travel, sustainable, look at the word responsible travel. It sounds like a burden. It's like something you need to do for the good of the planet. It's just a really great holiday. It's like being where I am right now in a lovely place, three kilometers away from any town, just quiet, beautiful, lots of bird song, fireplace. It's a fabulous time that I'm having. So the language that we use has to be so important in the change that we're making. Uh, you know, sometimes in our enthusiasm, we get carried away. We wanted to do the right thing, right? So we wanted to encourage people that go out and have a different kind of holiday where you're not living in a cocoon, but you're living in a wildlife property that has no boundaries, that lets the deer herds walk through. Um, but we made the messaging so heavy and, you know, inaccessible that it was something that only Jholawalas did right and and i see a little bit of that happening with uh, the wildlife as well it, it's something that a colleague of mine alerted me to this morning and he said that you know what is happening is that in the excitement right now after the pandemic uh you know uh, nature and wildlife is being talked about as our savior and something that can protect us but if we don't get the way we talk about it right from this moment on it's also going to end up to leading to a lot of uh, abuse of nature, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of misuse and a lot of problems. So it's very important that when we start this messaging, this communication, and I think that's a very important task for something like the Biodiversity Collaborative, to get the messaging and the tone right from the start so that it's it's fun, it's accessible, it's everyday. Uh, you know, we do, these, uh, we do these little infographics where we try to explain these everyday concepts, right? What's biodiversity? What is a, you know, what's a wildlife corridor? What is habitat fragmentation? Um, how are frogs different from toads? And they're lovely visual representations that just make these concepts so easy and accessible that we've had people from teachers to parents write to us saying like, this is fabulous. Can you give us more of this? Uh, so there are ways to, you know, do this right. In fact, I saw a question that came up in the Q&A, which was from somebody called Abhinaya, who talked about, you know, exactly this. How do I talk to my friends about wildlife without being accused of being preachy? Abhinaya, uh, look at Rohan's work. Uh, one that always uh, stands out in my mind is that, like any normal person, I'm not a fan of lizards, right? Uh, but in this past year, I have a new love for them because I discovered the Draco, which is like this mini flying dragon. And it has all these amazing superpowers. So it's this lizard that can fly, that has complete camouflage. It can completely disappear into a bark. It has this, you know, beautiful yellow dewlap that's striking. And Rohan's comic was one of the funnest ways for me to learn about it and encounter it. And, you know, it's a great way to initiate people into talking about it. So let's get that messaging and tone right. It's possible and we can do it. Yeah, I really wanted to go to you, Ron, anyways, but I'm really glad that Neha mentioned you because, you know, you do that so well. You know, you really do it so well to really reach out to many people. So, I mean, do you have any advice to to other communicators out there who are many of who are actually attendees i could tell you on, on, on how how do you do this how do you actually put it in a way that it touches people because as rt has said you know it's extremely heterogeneous so we can't say general audience in any sense of the word so but but still you do it i still think you, you do it quite well so I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts well, like responsible tourism, even the word advice feels like a burden to me. So I'm going to approach it differently. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, uh, while I have, yes, I've been doing cartoons and comics, I think it's it's also the time for me and other others like me to uh, take it upon themselves to evolve with the way, you know, this course is shaping up around us. Uh, what Subhagunam said really resonated with me. Uh, the, the relevance and the importance of, of vernacular vocabulary and that's something you know that's that's one of the changes that i'm trying to bring into the way i approach my subject as well and you know i, I i've been following a lot of uh, young activists who have uh, languages and backgrounds different from mine and you know that challenges me to uh, to to open up to to, to, the, to the kind of viewpoints that they bring in for example there's uh, this uh, uh, there's this communicator and activist from tamil nadu called yuvan 
who who goes by the moniker a naturalist column on social media and he's been doing some terrific work on uh, on translating uh, the local relevance of certain creatures like like you know coastal snails and uh, conches and how they are important to uh, say a fishing community and indigenous fishing community and what kind of value the community assigns to them and how their lives revolve revolve around these creatures and this is something that me sitting in nagpur or hyderabad is is i am completely oblivious to so you know that's even though i know i have a general overview of what kind of wildlife to expect in what when different parts of the country there are these minute things happening around uh, you know various parts of the country that you only come to know about when you are open to a voice that is completely different from yours and i think that's really important for communicators like me to open up to and to adapt so 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 when um can you follow up with this i actually in particular i'd really like to hear you know what what can we do to address some of these issues with our infrastructure right because you know it's one thing to say we want to do all these things but we also need proper infrastructure and processes available so if you're thinking about something like a mission that we're trying to promote you know we we would have potentially the access to funding that could support infrastructure so i'd really like to hear from you about what what would we need to do what would you do if if i had money in my hand and could give it out the way you want it to be given out right uh, giving the money from my hand i would like to i wish i could understand the uh, people see to make people understand what we are uh, talking about or what we are telling them uh, to engage we must understand the people we must understand the people associated with each ecosystem different people have different knowledge and different understanding uh, rural and urban people both does not have equal understanding about the ecosystem and the biodiversity we should in, we should be inspired to develop a positive connection uh, with them um in india uh, to take in india rural and urban people have different levels of understanding predominantly in rural areas natural habitats are greatly not disturbed since they have a good understanding of nature and their lifestyle is in harmony with nature then they need not be told what they need to do but they need they, they can be told how to preserve what they have most of the transgressions happen uh, uh, cessations happen because of the miscommunication misconception and misunderstanding of the people of the the native people the administration here is acting with one way communication people are told only what to do and not asked what to do the opinion of them their, their opinion does not matter at all so we should consider their opinion we should ask them okay what can we do come here sit with us discuss with us what what do you have about the what knowledge do you have about this place your place where you you have been living for centuries uh, share share your knowledge with us and we will share your know share our knowledge with you we can tra transfer our, share our knowledge and we can decide a infrastructure we can create a process uh, that is the thing we should do here only that that will i i hope that only we will be the best strategy for communication with public in here Yeah, uh, that's really great advice. Yeah. Keep keep going. Continue. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were stopping me. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no. Okay, fine. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, segregate the uh, the set of people in three different ways. One, uh, rural people. The next, urban people, urban population, and then uh, children, youth, and of course, uh, specifically the tribal population. We should think about them in the separate manner because they have a detailed and uh, great uh, treasure of knowledge regarding the nature and biodiversity. um i already told about the rural areas right when we come to the urban areas uh, such conservation measures awareness understanding uh, protection committees everything lies mostly in the elite society middle class lower middle class people are more bothered about their day to day affairs economical situation and literally they don't have enough time to learn or engage in conserving the urban biodiversity it's the fact here in practical situation the most serious uh, stumbling block way in the ecosystem i believe uh, in the eco development is the fact that uh, masses of people are poor uneducated and so fragmented by barriers of caste and religion they they don't they doesn't have a chance to act together on a common interest um so major contribution from the educational organizations voluntary organizations governments is they should organize these peoples to cooperate with each other in good management of uh, natural resources uh, they could uh, help the people to 
make proper advantage of the many government schemes that are designed to help them in this endeavor. Um, government should engage all sections of its citizens in urban areas in getting to know and appreciating the nature around them. I hope everyone are aware about the everyone know about the biodiversity. What is it? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, biodiversity management committees in the rural areas uh, yes. where the people biodiversity register is being uh, handled. That could be implemented similarly in the urban areas too, from the ward wise to municipalities to the city level. Um, ward wise uh, uh, biodiversity management committees could gather the people, they can communicate with the people in the local language. They can create a register for the local biodiversity, which was uh, which is there in the ward. They can create the people biodiversity biodiversity register and uh, coordinate with professionals and subject knowledge experts who have uh, field knowledge. Uh, all can come together in the ward wise documentation of the biodiversity. That can be taken to the next level in the municipal wise uh, committees. That municipal wise committees can create an infrastructure like uh, biodiversity parks community centers where people, kids, they can come together, they can discuss uh, regarding their uh, biodiversity, uh, the native biodiversity, uh, the endemic species, the endemic trees, which are, in which are endangered, which are in uh, danger now because of the exotic species coming in. All these things, they can discuss all these things, they can share their information, they can register the species they have cited. Everything can be done in the that park and community centers, etc. And that municipality level bio biodiversity management committees could come together to create a city wise uh, uh, management committees. And that could uh, have a major part in um, building awareness and sensitizing the whole city, uh, citizens, schools, colleges, and authorities. See, uh, I personally believe that uh, bringing the biodiversity management and the current issues uh, in the syllabus of schools and colleges is, is itself the most important thing we should do. Because uh, the kids are learning about uh, all these, th all the things uh, for the for taking marks to the to take it to the college to the job everything, but they need to know. By I believe that they need to know the things around them and the issues around them present in the present situation, so that they can live in harmony with nature. We should create all these uh, process. The process should be uh, around all these things. It should concentrate all these things. Only then uh, we can create. Uh, we can spend the amount which we come given for, give from on our hand in a correct manner. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, he, so Subhanu just gave a huge number of very, very important and essential um, things that we need to do. I mean, there are many things we need to do. So, but I want to know. What do we do on day one? Okay, so this is an Anil Kumar and I are, are very much in sync. He asked this question about, you know, can one action point that's urgently needed. So if I if I go to each one of you and I say, what do what do we do tomorrow? Re literally tomorrow, if we if we can do it, what would we need to take up to kind of address this issue of of awareness and connection with uh, with people that we've been talking about this entire session? RT, I, I'll go to you first. Oops. Um, um, I'd really like to know what we need to, to address, if you know what I mean, you know? So maybe go back, maybe the day before day, day one, day zero, um, we do some kind of a serious understanding of who it is that we need to speak to, um, or identify all the different segments what they know, what they don't, or how they know it and how they don't know it. See, there's a difference. Uh, and, and, um, and when we know that, uh, then we will be able to develop uh, uh, messaging or programs or whatever it is appropriately, because it's not going to be one size fits all. Absolutely, right? Um, especially given, given the diverse nature of everything that we're dealing with here. Um, so, so I think it would be know your audience, uh, would be would be my first uh, my first submission that that's something that we'd have to do. It's going to be a humongous exercise, you know. But then um, those kinds of data are collected already by the government, and if we are doing this with the government, then they have the tentacles, you know, to to spread out and and do this. So, um, but but that would be important. And then the messaging um, when we develop it to keep it super 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 simple, you know, and and very very you know laser sharp. But 
but also wide enough and broad enough to make those connections, you know, because that biodiversity does not exist in a vacuum. Everything is connected to everything else. So to bring out that web. So, um, so yeah, I think it would just be that, you know, know your audience so that you'll be able to tailor messages, whatever your messaging may be uh, effectively. Very true. Uh, Neha, over to you. Tell me what to do. <laughs> Tell India what to do, actually. Because, <laughs> you know, the thing is, I'm a content creator, right? So I can think about the challenges that we face and that would, you know, like, we're creating this content, we're trying to make the science accessible, we're trying to tell you fun stories, we're trying to do what Arti just talked about, right? Keeping the messaging very simple, not be preachy, just build the connections, make people care. But then how do I get it out there beyond a point? And I think Oh it just lost her. Oh wait till she comes back. Sorry, so can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so sorry about that. And you know, the government can really help, a National Biodiversity Mission could really help in building that kind of infrastructure. You know, if we could get some of this content out to every single local village school, and uh, I'm just going to turn my video off. And Kendra Vidyale, you know, that would be great if we could get it out to colleges. Uh, there's a National Green Corps program, you know, if, if we could piggyback on that and get out some of Rohan's utterly fun stuff in front of them. Just, I think that just doing that, we have a generation of very smart young people growing up in India, whether it is rural or urban. We don't need to tell them what to do, but we do need to get the information to them. And while number one is getting the communication right, there is already a trickle of that. There are people doing good work. So we also need that system to get it out there to everybody. You know, the maximum possible reach, the maximum number of people looking at this, thinking about it, feeling a sense of awe, wonder, you know, it'll automatically transform into wanting to love it, protect it, look after it, be a part of making a change. I think that will come. Very good. Um, Rowan, what do we do? Shannon, I have to, uh, I'm compelled to speak about something larger here. I think, uh, you know, the very definitions that we need, that we go by of conservation of biodiversity, those, those are the things that need upheaval. If you ask me what really needs to be done urgently, I think it is this. Uh, this is something I've learned by, by experience. You know, uh, when I started out communicating, I thought, say something like bushmeat. You know, I, I, I thought bushmeat is a villain. I thought shifting cultivation is the villain, right? But when I actually went and uh, visited these places, say for, for example, Arunachal Pradesh, I sat with a family that relies on bushmeat for subsistence. I, well, I didn't eat bushmeat, bushmeat with them, but, but I, I ate the meat that, that was available in their houses. And they, uh, while on one hand, they are telling me about stories about how they hunt certain animals. On the other hand, they're also telling me about what their community does you know, in order to conserve them, how they are able to achieve a sort of balance, uh, which is something that governments fail to do, right? So, so these concepts that we go by, which are obviously influenced by, you know, the Western influence on our history and government, these, these are things that need uh, an immediate upheaval. And uh, what my recommendation as a simple artist or communicator would be is that our Ministry of Environment needs to do less webinars and more field visits engage with grassroots better. Uh, Subhaganam, I want to go to you uh, with an audience question, if you don't mind. Um, I'll just, because you have mentioned so many things in your in your previous answer. So, but there's, it's a question that relates to something that you actually had said earlier, and it's uh, by Anil Kurhi. He said, there's an urgent need for tribal participation in these issues. And I'd, I'd just like you to comment, you know, how, how do we, do that, right? Like, I mean, obviously we talked about language and culture and things like that, but what are some ways that we can also physically reach out to, to tribal communities? And and I might also add, you also mentioned- uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sharon was I'm breaking sorry. for me. Am could I breaking? Please, uh, uh, okay. I, I think there was a network issue here. Could you please repeat that part? How do we reach tribal communities? How do we do this? 
okay um how do we reach the tribal communities sir? yes actually uh, we, uh, there is a uh, there is an act right forest rights act for tribal protection uh, first we should implement the tribal protection uh, implement the act in every uh, tribal panchayats every gram sabhas to protect their land rights in the forests and uh, all biodiversity areas so uh, uh, next step uh, after that is uh, we should document we should document the tribal uh, knowledge their traditional knowledge uh, that will be the best thing and first thing we should do in uh, bringing them into the bio, as a part in the biodiversity conservation uh, in madhav gatkil dr madhav gatkil so western got ecological uh, report he told that we should incentivize the tribal people in uh, creating a social uh, forestry management com uh, committees uh, from gram sabha from gram sabha gram sabha level from gram sabha level that could help them in uh, their livelihoods and also in protecting the forests and, con and conserving the biodiversity i think that would be the best way uh, to connect with them by uh, documenting their language and uh, incentivizing them to protect the forests so i just like to follow up because i think i asked it during while you had a network issue it's a it's a separate question but it is a little bit rela related to reaching out i mean you also mentioned that lower and middle class uh, uh, residents don't they just don't have time um to to worry about that i and i can very much appreciate appreciate that that issue so so given that they don't have the luxury right of the you know the rich men's conservation game that we often have in our in, in all over the world how, how do you how do you do that you mentioned education of course is one way bring it into schools but what about the parents how do we reach them yeah the as a content creator uh, every uh, not only a uh, lower middle class or middle class also the elite people all the people are uh, very much attracted to the interesting contents the the content must be interesting and that should connect the connect with them emotionally right uh, we should we we, uh, we should create such contents uh, regarding biodiversity conservation and nature which could connect with them personally so that they can uh, know about the biodiversity uh, after uh, giving them the knowledge about the biodiversity the next step is to kind of make them engage in the bio conservation steps to uh, to engage them in the conservation steps we should uh, i already told that the ward wise uh, management committees right that ward wise com uh, management committees could help them you, uh, they can uh, come to the uh, management committees ward wise in the weekends the, their kids from the schools they can draw them to the committees they can uh, have discussions in the weekends they can have discussions during the year they they can create a evening tuition classes uh, which was uh, done uh, in many villages which were, which was which are being done in the many villages for uh, uh, adults to learn uh, to learn like that we can create uh, evening classes we can make evening classes which where the adults from the lower middle class and middle class societies can come after their job after the, when they have a free time to learn about the biodiversity and what can uh, and uh, they can decide what can they do from the other side at, at least at the least I, i love that idea of impregnating um ideas like like maybe have them do their elocution on something related to biodiversity right so i mean that's like such a cool idea i i really love that idea rt if you don't mind i want to come to you with one of the audience questions um it's by An anushka kale uh she says there are times when we have to choose between ecological biodiversity and people's rights and livelihoods and how do you communicate about this and i come to you because it's something that you do quite beautifully and poignantly in many cases So could you follow up? Uh yeah. Um so it's it's interesting in in what I have seen um the uh the 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 livelihoods that are closest to the land or to the water they depend upon the land and upon the water. Those guys are uh far more tuned in to the uh, to what's happening to the they don't call it biodiversity but you know to what's happening around them and um and the choice is almost um it, it's 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 different in the sense that okay i'll give you an example for, you know for, for example there's this whole thing about overfishing right um 
it comes back to it comes to following a problem back to its source, walking it back in history. You know, there are reasons why um, overfishing is happening now. It's because people are desperate. Why are people desperate? Because the fish are declining in the rivers. Why why are the fish declining in the rivers? There's destruction happening somewhere else. Uh, what destruction is happening? There's riverbed uh, rock mining, which which is habitat for little fish, which you know they they're underneath that, or the wetlands are disappearing, which are nurseries of fish, and so on and so forth. So you walk things back, and you realize that the problem is not these people who live closest to the land. The problem is elsewhere. So I think you know it's important for us to step back and take like a systems thinking, like a basin-wide view. And I'm just I'm, I'm giving the example of rivers and therefore basin-wide view to see what all is happening, make those connections, and and then the answers kind of suggest themselves to us. Very very rarely. Um, is is it something that is so local that you know you can solve it locally? It's unfortunate, but that's the way uh, you know a system, uh, an ecosystem works. Yeah, and, and it's a, such a delicate balance between the two. And actually, I must say that you actually addressed. We have had several questions about this. Really, it's a really delicate issue, right? Because you have to really balance the needs of so many. You know, this idea that that the environment has needs, the ecosystem has needs, humans have needs. Governments have needs, industries have needs. Exactly, yeah. and it comes to, it, it comes, it's distilled yeah. into this really concentrated thing when it comes to a river, you know? You look at a river and every possible person has a, a claim on some part of it or in some way, right? So uh, these things come to a head and uh, there are no easy answers, surely. And I think that's why, you know, there are people like Nachiket Kelkar and others who are doing excellent work because they live in history they live in the in the in the contemporary and they make those connections and you know they they're not painting rosy pictures or you know saying everything's fine and everything's going to be okay they're very realistic and you just learn so much from just you know, listening to them make those connections i think it's it's fabulous um, that kind of uh, environmental education if you will i think we would all be better served by getting so Vanavij asked the related questions. I'll just follow up with this. Uh, how, so how do you get businesses involved, right? Because they have uh, an economic need as well. Um, and how do you get them involved in, in biodiversity? Maybe, maybe through some of the issues you just talked about or maybe through, through additional means. Is that a question for me? Was that a yeah, question, question for me? <laughs> We were talking about it. I thought it was a related question. See, yeah. that, it's, it's a hairy one. Yesterday, I was speaking to uh, one of the topmost VCs, the venture capitalists uh, in India, and um, I was discussing this issue with him because I wanted to get a sense of what he sees, uh, you know, as where industry is going and so on and so forth. And he was talking about bringing the head honchos or the, the, the minds of the corporates together into a, um, a sustained working session or, or making some kind of a group where they think through these things consciously or they are, um, they are walked through some of these things consciously so that they, uh, and then they're held to certain things, but that hasn't happened yet. So, but it is something, you know, where you can involve these people and um, it's, I know it's, uh, it's a long shot, it's a Hail Mary, but you, you I think it's something that's worth trying uh, to, to involve them and see and then hold them accountable to, to certain things, you know, if, you, if, if they come up with a plan of how to address some of these things. So, um, yeah, he, he's planning to bring those people together and more power to him. I hope, I hope it happens at some point, yeah. I think we, I think we all do. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to shift gears a little bit to Neha, and I'm going to ask you a question about um, education because I do know that's not something that you are personally dealing with but something that round glass deals with a lot so so it's you know how do we work with the education system on this there is of course curriculum aspects of it as Subhangana mentioned this those of course actually generating curriculum but there's also lots of ways that we can in, in, interchange and work with teachers and I know that round glass is doing that and you're doing that through sustain in many ways could you comment on some of those yeah, may I also just add one point to what Arti was talking about, but Absolutely. so much of what we've said today is about speaking a language that people understand, and I sometimes wonder if with businesses, the thing to do is to find a language of economics, you know, if, if there is a way to quantify numbers, impact, so that, you know, somebody understands that 
if I am doing something that results in the cutting down of 100 trees, I might in 10 years be saving 1 million, but as a long-term business, I'm going to be losing much more. So I, I feel like maybe if we can find that economic language that speaks to them, uh, that might be something that helps to make that connect. Schools, uh, see, um, Round Glass does has a program when we're trying to innovate with education and uh, put it out in different ways. And it's a question that we've been engaging with Sustain a lot uh, because we've also got a lot of people uh, naturally coming us to us and saying that, hey, some of the resources you're creating have been great for us. And how can we, you know, get you to do more with our students? Uh, so, you know, uh, some of the things that uh, we've been thinking about, uh, you know, for example, is, for example, in the IB uh, curriculum, uh, students learn about the habitats that they, you know, but the habitats are often reduced to two page black and white charts. So obviously to really make a child learn that lesson or feel a connection with it, if we can show them the habitats of India, alive, real, transported there with the voice of an expert, that's something that would add value. And, you know, uh, we'd love to tie up with schools and get that out there. Uh, we've been talking about things like creating a little program that, you know, if with some collaborations and supports, we can get out to schools and colleges on a World Environment Day or something like that, where, you know, we're, we're just, again, just showing them this immense diversity. Uh, and, you know, and just creating resources that teachers find helpful. And what we've realized is that, you know, for teachers, it's very practical in many ways, right? They have a curriculum and they have to finish it. So you can't really go out and change the curriculum right now. But what you can do is provide resources that they can point the children to. You, We can provide anecdotes that make things come alive for people and, you know, sort of support them uh, in this manner. Uh, the other thing we want to do is to also bring this idea of environmental education out. Of course, it's meant for schools and colleges, but it's also just meant for anybody, right? You know, anybody can become a sort of hobby naturalist and be interested in this whole idea. So it would be great if over time we could just create these little modules where, you know, you know, uh, learn to identify the spiders around you, learn about the habitats of India, learn about some of the core issues that we face, you know, things like that. So, uh, you know, lots of things like that, that I think can uh, happen and be done. Um, yeah, <laughs> so. Very, very good, yeah. And there's, I think there's a lot of- Just a minute. Uh, speaking of economics, I'd like to add a point that we should uh, explore the green economy much more than now. Uh, because we all speak that green economy could help in uh, creating a sustainable economical status and also the environmental protection. But uh, to the to what end? Uh, how uh, how can it protect the environment and give a sustainable economy? We should create a report. We should actually uh, we should create the guidelines for green absolutely. economy. Absolutely, I think you, you've raised such an important point there because um, that's something that uh, I know the Echo Network, we're working with the, one of our partners, the India Climate Collaborative, to actually do that very thing, to try to look at things like climate action as a, an economic opportunity for, for local communities, not for you know some big corporation, but for like individuals in, in local communities to actually increase their prospects and their economic well-being and their development in general. I think actually doing that better, making it look as biodiversity, economic, they're not burdens. Right, they're not burdens that we have, but they're actually opportunities to make everything better. Our well-being, mentally, emotionally, physically, better. So I think that's a very, very important point you raise. Um, Ron, can I can I come to you for a question? There's quite a few questions that are kind of related about you know this dis disillusionment of the biodiversity sector. There's an anonymous question here, and it's it's this idea that you know people don't want to always hear things you know they don't they're not interested in it you know they're just they're they have their own their own um needs and wants and they don't align with a lot of things that we need to do for biodiversity and conservation so do you have any um, any thoughts on on how how do we how do we fend off this this uh the, these feelings well i think the more personal you make these issues uh, as communicators I, I you know i think the more the more it is difficult to disengage disengage with these matters so that's always been my approach. Uh, you know, uh, to revolve my narrative around around my own life first, and then the life of my reader. So, uh, you know, it, it it always boils down to something that I can both uh, 
you know find interesting enough to retain as well as respond to uh which is which is sort of the, the kind of uh, uh the evocation i want i want to arouse in my reader as well and and yeah i think uh, that, that's that's been the basis of all the communication that i put out Yes, ab absolutely. Um, do I, does anyone want to follow up on this? Because it's this really such an important question. I mean, uh, uh, maybe RT or Neha or uh, or Subhaganam. How do we, how do we get past this? Yeah, Subhaganam, go ahead. Sorry, uh, pardon. Could you please repeat? Uh... Yeah, we were just we we're, uh, we're just talking about this issue of of the of disillusionment with people about some of these issues that they just don't want to hear about it, right? It's very hard to reach them sometimes. There's one where they can't get the issues. That's one issue. We talked a lot about that. But what if they're able to, but they're just not willing to listen? How how do we deal with that? Um, we should uh, to that kind of people. We should make them understand the seriousness of the issue. That is the one. I think that is the only way to. Uh, make them listen to what you are saying. Um, yeah, I think, it, and bring it home, like uh, like uh, Rohan said. You know, it's uh, it's it may seem like it's far away. It may seem like it's happening in Arunachal, but it's going to come back to roost. It's going to come home to roost. You know, in so many different ways. Because today it may be Arunachal, tomorrow it's going to be Godavari. The day after it's going to be some other place. You know, very close to home. And uh, these things have repercussions. One just has to look at the Faraka Dam to know what kinds of repercussions and for how long it's been going on. Um, and uh, so, so I think making those connections is really important. You know, it's uh, the 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 actual infrastructure project, or just or the or the uh, the point of uh, pain is just the beginning. You know, it's it's got effects in time and in space, and to do. To be able to tell those stories are really important. They're slow. Nobody wants to hear them. The mainstream is not going to carry it. So I think it comes down to people like us, uh, where you know we have to break our heads because we really have to cut through the clutter and the noise and all of that to make this make this come for, uh, come alive. And it's 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 something I grapple with grapple with every day. It's really hard to be able to make people sit up and listen. But one thing I found that's really that really helps is when you get in front of them and you tell them the story face to face, you know, you, you engage, they are able to ask questions and they'll say, but, or, you know, most often I hear, but this has worked so well somewhere else. And you, you know, you're, you're able to, to explain why what works somewhere may not work somewhere else because, you know, local geographies are getting. So um, I think that that kind of engagement, one on one to one or one to many, but face to face and uh, be able to take them along with you on that journey. Um, it helps. And I think I, I, something that I've been wanting to say to Rohan forever, but uh, what he does with his cartoons, um, I have seen my daughter, who is a teenager, share it ad nauseum, and she loves his cartoons. And these kids are so, um, you know, they're, they're self-absorbed in a different way, you know, and, and for this to be able to break through that and make sense to them, I think he's doing a splendid job, and uh, and it's great because we need every kind of tool in our toolbox to be able to tell these stories and um, and and rise above, you know, all the other stuff that's going on. It's an honor, Arthi. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> uh, one more thing, I already told that to deal with the lack of awareness, we should deal with the lack of knowledge uh, about the importance, right? Uh, for that, I told that engaging the people will be a great tool to create a knowledge base in them, in, in between them. So the engaging means not only uh, teaching them, the engage doesn't not only uh, means teaching them to uh, serve in uh, growing trees, planting trees, uh, to uh, speak in uh, discussions and like that and like that. Uh, they, they could engage by, uh, by engaging, they can change by not using plastics in their homes. Even that is a change in a per personal uh, life, right? Uh, they will change from by their behavior. They will change in their behavior when we engage the peoples in the municipality levels and ward levels. So that uh, when we uh, when where, where there is 20 people, 20 families and 19 families are uh, engaging and uh, concentrating in this such activities. Uh, another one family which uh, you were telling right, before, right? I will not listen. Why I should listen for that? I will just go away. Such family, uh, if that one family is such a family. 
he will see that 19 families and he will start listening okay what are they listening why are they doing this activities what is there in that okay let's see we will try it once they will come like that uh such a good point so and 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 you know you're absolutely right if there's one thing i've learned living in this fantastic country it's that it is 100% capable of change enormous change in a norm in really short periods of time and i think we have stand at really a crossroads to do this for our biodiversity and i hope through your help uh, all of you that will be able to do this i think that's what we all want so and that note i really need to thank all of you artis vaganam neha and rohan for all joining us for this webinar today your, your thoughts are fantastic and i want to thank all of the attendees as well if you need further information if we didn't answer your question you can contact us at contact at biodiversitycollaborative.org so everyone should also follow us. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, all the big names <laughs> as Biodiversity Collaborative. And I also hope you'll join us. We have one more webinar coming up uh, and, and it's coming up on Tuesday on the, at the 27th of October at four o'clock and it's on climate change mitigation and disaster re resilience challenges for eco India's ecosystems. So thank you again, the, our four panelists, our attendees, and of course, our support from the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor for helping us conduct these webinars. Mwah. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you all you. so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.